Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Reflections here on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. You'll have noticed that the introductory music's been changed this week. There's a reason, and it's this. In 1912, the White Star Line completed work on a new passenger liner. She had the ability to carry 3,000 passengers but carried life-saving equipment for only a fraction of that number. She was triple screw and capable of speeds of up to 25 knots. On April the 10th, she left Southampton on a maiden voyage to New York. At 11.40 on the evening of April the 14th, she struck an iceberg. Within half an hour, it was obvious that she couldn't survive. At 12.45, the first lifeboat was lowered, and at 2.20 on the morning of the 15th of April, the RMS Titanic disappeared beneath the waves. Just over 1,500 souls perished, and just over 700 were saved. Of that 700, there now remains in England but four, and it's my most especial privilege to welcome one of them to this week's edition of Reflections. Eva Hart, thank you for seeing me. And can you tell me, first of all, where and when you were born? I was born in Ilford, the 31st of January 1905. Were you an only child? I was. What was your father's occupation? He was a master builder. When was it established that you were first, in fact, going to America? Well, I can't tell you exactly, but it must have been some months earlier because my father decided to join a friend already out there in business and all the particulars had to be arranged and the house had to be sold. So it was some months, but I really can't tell you how many. At what point during the proceedings was the Titanic first mentioned? Uh, we had booked a passage in a ship called the Philadelphia, and we had notice to say that she wouldn't sail because it was a strike. And that uh, aggravated my father very much because he wanted to get to Canada in time to make all these business arrangements. And so he used to go and see the shipping company, implore them uh, to let him travel by another ship. And the morning they wrote and said we could go in the Titanic. That is my first. That was the first we ever heard of it. Did you, in fact, know that it was going to be the maiden voyage, do you remember? Yes. And my mother was terrified because she thought it was flying in the face of God to travel in a ship that they said was unsinkable. Where did you uh, join the Titanic? Oh, Southampton. Can you recall for us your first view of the ship? Well, there was this tremendous ship lying at the dockside and it seemed whichever way you looked, you couldn't see the end of it. I'd never seen a big ship before and I was very impressed. Do you recall the near collision when the ship left Southampton? Well, I didn't see it, but I did hear about it. Everybody was talking about it. And I remember asking my father what a tug was. I'd never heard of one. Can you describe for us, if you will, the standard of the second-class accommodation and the facilities as you remember them, or indeed in hindsight? Well, in hindsight, I realised they were very nice indeed. I've travelled in a good many ocean liners since. Not any of the very large ones, I agree, but I would have thought that the second-class Titanic was well comparable with the smaller ships that I've travelled in first class. Can you remember, or indeed did you ever know, the cost of your passage? I understand it was £26.5, shillings, which in those days, I suppose, was quite a lot of money. Do you uh, ever recall seeing uh, the captain, Captain Smith, at all? Oh, yes, I do. I recall seeing him well, at least three times, I would think, twice. I remember he spoke to me. He admired a teddy bear I had, and I thought he was very nice. Can we, perhaps at this stage, talk about the premonition, which I know uh, your mother had at the time? Well, yes, she had a premonition from the very word go, and that was totally unlike her. She wasn't that sort of person at all. And I always remember she used to get very annoyed with people who were superstitious. But she had this firm premonition of danger from the very word go, and when she knew we were travelling in the Titanic, uh, she said that was flying in the face of God, because she, this ship was declared to be unsinkable. She said when we boarded the ship, I have made up my mind that I will not go to bed in this ship at night. I will sleep in the daytime and I will sit up at night. Whereupon my father said, well, if you want to be so stupid, I can't stop you. But I don't know what you think people will say. And she said, I don't mind what they say. That is what I'm going to do. Well, that to a seven-year-old was in incomprehensible. I'd sleep in the daytime, you know, I couldn't understand it. But in consequence of her doing that, which she did, I was amused all day by my father, who spoiled me terribly, and I, I just loved being with him all day. Did your father ever take this premonition in 
the least degree seriously. I don't know. I know he was very cross about it. He thought it was very silly. Did you make friends on board? And if you did, uh, bearing in mind the tragedy, did, did any of them survive? Well, I played with a lot of children. There was one little girl I liked particularly, and I was desperately sorry for her because she just lost her mother. And she was with her aunt and her father. Well, when the passenger list came out eventually, we saw that her father had drowned. But she was uh, listed. But I, we didn't know the, the auntie's name because she was a maiden lady. And we knew that she was related on the mother's side, so we couldn't find out where she was. And it was many years before I saw an article in the paper about her, and I got in touch with her then. And unfortunately, she died about a couple of years ago. I didn't see her again. But she lived in Scotland. We used to telephone each other and write to each other. On the evening of um, April the 14th, uh, what time did you go to bed? I think about my usual time, which was 7 o'clock. How did you first become aware, then, that things were, in fact, amiss? When my mother wakened me, and she had already um, positively pulled my father out of bed, who didn't want to get up and see what was wrong, because she'd had him out of bed the night before, when she heard some strange sounds which it transpired afterwards was ice flows in the sea and they bumped against the side of the ship. But trying to get him up on the night of the actual disaster was quite hard work. He wasn't really keen about that. But that's when I first realised that there must be something very wrong because she started to get me out of bed. But he slipped a very heavy coat on and went out and the lift, which went up to the boat deck, was quite close to our cabin, came back, what seemed to me, to be very quickly. Were you actually told at this stage what had happened? No, nobody knew what had happened at that stage. And anyway, my father, my mother didn't even ask him. She used to say years afterwards that she didn't have to ask him. She didn't know what it was, but she knew it was this fearsome thing that had been hanging over her head. Did she, in fact, um, make reference later on to uh, any physical feeling of the impact? Yes, she said that she was reading, and, and the glass of orange juice that she'd got on the little table um, just quivered, didn't slop over, and she said it felt very much like a train pulling into a station. Did you, um, at that time, see the the uh, iceberg? No, because we went up onto the port side and the iceberg was on the starboard side. But we saw it when we were in the lifeboats, we could see it. OK, so your father came back then. What happened next? He carried me and he put his thick coat on my mother and put another coat on himself and uh, we went up onto the deck and we made straight for a lifeboat. And he said to my mother, now don't move from here, don't let anyone move you, I'll go and see what's happened. And he went away and he came back and said that the ship had struck an iceberg. And again my mother in this quiet way of hers didn't ask anything about it, she just stood there. And we were there for some time, I don't know how long, and then people were coming up onto the deck and saying what's happened. And um, he went away again and came back and said he'd been talking to an officer and that they were going to lower the lifeboats. But he said, it's only a precaution, you'll be back on board for breakfast. As they started to lower the lifeboats, of course, he offered to help. And he did help, and he put, helped the officers to put the women and children. And he put my mother and I into the lifeboat quite easily because we were there, you see. Can I ask you, in fact, the, the, the circumstances under which you last saw your father then? Yes, I last saw him leaning over the rail, looking at us as the boat was lowered and telling me to be good. And he said, hold by his hand and be a good girl. I was crying. And uh, that's the last I saw of him. What was your overall view of the situation at that time? Well, our boat was very overcrowded. Uh, but I don't, I really don't remember any panic in the boat. There was a lot of talking and shifting around, but it was terribly overcrowded. I understand that there were boats that uh, left the ship not even filled. We'd had no boat drill, you know. None at all? None whatever. I realise it was um, 2 a.m. Now, uh, in view of that, can you tell us how much you actually could see? Well, I could see it all. Um, the Titanic was a blaze of light. She had lights on after she went below the water. Well, part of her went below the water because she broke in half. She did break in half? Absolutely. There's no question about it. And the forward part of the ship went down by the nose quite quickly. 
but the star lifted up in the air and it seemed to stay there and then just healed over into the water and that's when we heard all the people screaming. When you say that the rear half um, lifted into the air and stood there, have you the slightest idea how long you were talking about? Not the slightest. No, I don't know. What can you tell us about the uh, musicians aboard the ship? Well, I can only tell you they were playing when my lifeboat left. How long they played, I don't know. Now there's anybody else, because if they played until the ship actually sank, if they played until all the lifeboats are gone, then there's nobody can tell you because no one else was saved. Again, if we read the books and see the many films, there are uh, supposed pictures of men conducting orchestras and that. Uh, in actual fact, in terms of numbers, what are we talking about? Three. Is it possible that you could describe for us the very last few moments of the life of the Titanic? Well, it was horrible to look at, of course, and, and it was horrible to hear the people screaming because as they hit the water and there was a lot of thrashing about and screaming which was terrible for quite a while. And then, as I've said so often before, the silence that followed it was... The silence was deafening, if you know what I mean. It seemed as if the whole world was standing still because there was a lighted ship and people screaming and rushing about, and then there was nothing, only the darkness. Can I ask you then, um, as a seven-year-old, at what point you realised that you were not going to see your father again? I really think I realised that when he put me in the boat because I, I thought he was following me. When I realised he wasn't following me, then I think, looking back, that that was when I realised it. We also hear a question of boats being taken away from... Uh, people uh, in the water because of them getting overloaded. Is this again true? Is it fable? What, what if anything, uh, is your memory of this? Well, my memory is that I was in a very, very overcrowded boat and uh, the boats were all called together, to keep together, and uh, they decided that they would empty our lifeboats and go back and around to see if they could pick up anyone else. And uh, during this business of putting two in this lifeboat, three in that, four in that, one in that, I got separated from my mother. And uh, I didn't see her again until uh, aboard the Carpathia. But 50 people might have been saved in the first place if we'd had boat drill and the boats had been properly filled. As it was, these 50 people were distributed among the others, two here, three there. And uh, the officer went away with the boat, and I think he picked up five, I'm not sure, but they all died of exposure. Whilst we're on the subject of lifeboats, uh, what were the facilities aboard? They were nil. We had no blankets, no biscuits, no water. And only two of them had a light on. So you were saying that, they were, uh, that, that there were no facilities and, in fact, that you had had no lifeboat drill either? That's absolutely true. Of the um, films that have been made, in your view, what is the best portrayal? Well, there's only one portrayal that's worthy of mention, and that is A Night to Remember, which is a wonderful film, and entirely factual and beautifully made. The others, well, they're just rubbish. And, he, and you know, in that film, uh, he portrays the, the musicians just coming out onto the deck and playing Nearer My God to Thee, which undoubtedly is right, unquestionably. And uh, I've spoken to a lot of people on this subject since, but if they were on the starboard side of the ship, they wouldn't have heard it at all. And uh, so they wouldn't know whether, what it would play, but I know, because my, I was in church with my grandmother some time afterwards, uh, and they sang Nearer My God to Thee, and I came out, I was in tears. Can you describe to us, then, um, uh, your subsequent rescue? Well, as I'm sure you know, a very small ship, the uh, Carpathia, answered our call and came. 
Well, now, when you're in the middle of the ocean um, and you pull up, so to speak, and you've got this covey of lifeboats there, how do you get the people on board? You have no gangway as you have when you're at a dockside. So they opened a, a big hatch in the side of the ship that the luggage would be loaded into and put rope ladders down. So my poor mother and other women had to climb up a rope ladder swaying about above the ocean um, into the side of the ship, which although she was a very small ship, it was a long way up. And the sailor behind seeing she didn't fall, it must have been dreadful. Well, now, you can't send children up a rope ladder like that. So what they did was they sent sacks down into the lifeboats and tied it, put each one of us into a sack, and then put these huge cargo nets, which the cabin trunks and things would be put in. And the mesh of those nets is very large. Of course, children's legs would have gone through them. So we had to be put in sacks. Then put in these great nets and hauled up with the sea, down below, which seemed miles away, and you can imagine how frightening it was. Do you remember um, how long you were in the lifeboats about? I only know that the lifeboat uh, I was in was the last one to be picked up. I don't know. I think it must have been after 8 o'clock. Can we talk, um, if it's possible then, um, about uh, Captain Rostron? Oh, Captain Rostron was delightful, uh, very helpful and very sympathetic. Uh, we didn't have cabins or ship, uh, beds because the ship was already full, but they made us as comfortable as they possibly could, and passengers gave us clothes. And um, he was about a roundabout with us a great deal, steering his way through the icebergs and the fog, which was dreadful, the next day. And uh, we were all very grateful to him. And a few years ago, I was in Australia, and someone lent me a book of which I never heard before, and it was called Home from the Sea. And it's um, Captain Roston, or Sir, somebody Roston as he was then, um, it's his autobiography. And in it, he devotes a chapter to his rescue of the Titanic survivors, saying how he rescued them. And the icebergs were all round so thick, and he quotes, a hand other than mine must have guided me through these uh, icebergs to reach these lifeboats because we saw the ship come through two bergs, which, of course, if they'd swayed together, would have crushed that little ship of his just like a nut in a nutcracker. Let's talk, if we can, for a moment now, then, about um, Captain Lord and the matter of the Californian, if we can. Well, I saw a ship with its lights on at a distance that seemed very close. I remember crying out several times to my mother, why doesn't that ship come? Um, I've always understood that it was the Californian. Uh, there have been movers afoot, as you know, recently to say that it wasn't. But I find it difficult to believe that both Board of Trade Inquiries, the American and the British, would have been so sure about it if they hadn't gone into it very deeply. It wasn't very far off, that's for sure. Can we now come forward, as it were, what, 70 years, um, and talk for a moment about Dr. Ballard and his work. Well, when I first heard that this Dr. Ballard had discovered the Titanic, I must confess I was a bit upset about it. I thought, oh dear, is somebody going to go down and find it and probe about with it? I didn't like the idea at all. But he wrote to me, and um, he said he hoped to make a further dive, and uh, he would keep in touch. He made the dive, as you know, and he photographed the ship, and he assured me, as he has assured me on a number of occasions, that nothing would make him bring up one artifact, that he felt it was a grave, and as he says in his book, God rest the soul, they are sold. And I have got to know Dr. Ballard quite well and have done television programs with him, and I feel the Titan is, is quite safe from any sort of piracy as far as he's concerned. But of course, you can't say that now as far as the French are concerned because they have gone down and they have brought up artefacts, which makes me shudder. Would you like to give us, then, your view of anyone who bought things up, uh, whether with the intention of capitalising on it or not? I feel it's a grave robbery, and that, from me, 
is rather odd in some ways because I am not a person who goes to graves and puts flowers on it and thinks a lot about the actual place where anyone's body is because I'm a firm believer in the afterlife and I think once we have died, that's it. But there's something about the fact that 1,500 people died unnecessarily. That, to me, is the reason why the Titanic disaster will never be forgotten. Because had there been the simple matter of enough lifeboats, no one would have died. And so that is the grave which I feel should not be disturbed. And I have no faith in people who would go and disturb it. I have no faith in their word that they wouldn't sell anything they brought up from it. They say they won't, but I'm not happy about it at all. I would also like to talk to you, if I could. Um, surely someone who's been through this sort of horrific tragedy uh, must from time to time have suffered from dreams or nightmares? Oh, I did for a very long time. My childhood and my adolescent periods were fraught very much. But um, I always had my mother on hand to comfort me and I was devoted to my mother. And when she died, I, was, I felt that I've got to do something about these dreams. And so I, I did something which in these, this day and age we would call therapy. I went to see, in a state of absolute terror, but I went. Uh, but when you say you went to see again, in fact, the, um, the story almost has an amusing touch, your visit to the shipping agencies. Well, I deliberately went into a shipping agency in the city. When this, this thought came over me, I hadn't got my mother to comfort me if I had any more dreams. And the proper thing to do, of course, was to go to sea and try and get over the fright. So I just went in and inquired which was the farthest distance I could take. I said, what about Australia? Because I knew I had relatives there, although I'd never met them. And he said to me, yes, that or New Zealand. It should be far enough for you. So actually, I went to Singapore and then on to Australia. And I did get over, to a certain extent, my horror of the sea. I'm not comfortable at sea, but uh, it's not so bad. Can we also discuss, uh, if it is worth discussing, uh, the question of uh, compensation? My father was going to Canada because his business was not doing very well. There was a great deal of recession in England in 1911 and 12, and he was going to, to Canada deliberately. So he died when his finances were probably lower than they'd been for quite a time. And we moved in when we came back into a much, much smaller house than I'd ever been used to, and uh, we lived much more simply. I understand that the amount of compensation people got was a thousand pounds for the loss of a husband. I'm told that, which I suppose in those days was worth more than it is now. But that was very little. We lived quite simply after that. You and your mother arrived then in America, your mother having been widowed and you, as it were, semi-orphaned. Um, uh, can you describe for us the, 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 the matter then of that part of your life and the return? The first thing my mother said when she put her foot on dry land was, how soon can I go back home? So we didn't go to Canada. We stayed in New York for a couple of weeks and came straight back home. Uh, as the years have gone by, how bothered have you been by all the media attention, which has been absolutely inevitable? Well, it grows and grows and grows <laughs> because of so few of us now. I am the only living survivor in England who can remember it and still get about. There is a lovely lady, but she's much older than me, and she doesn't, I've done public speaking all my life, so she wouldn't go around doing the things I do. And then the other two are so much younger that they don't remember it. So the letters arrive and the requests to speak arrive constantly, and it's getting even worse. You see, I have to have people like you coming to see me and I have to chat away to you. <laughs> And very much obliged we are to chat with you as well. To give us some idea, how, how many times a, a week, a year, how many countries, how many studios? Oh, my goodness, I'd have to have time off to reckon that up. <laughs> um, I can tell you more about the letters. Um, I did keep count in 1987, and I had 503 letters from people I didn't know, asking for information, my autograph and that sort of thing. That's in addition to all my normal mail, which I have. Uh, I've had the most amusing 
uh, addresses and the post office have been wonderful. One was Eva Hart, 82, England, magistrate, please find her. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me what that certificate is on your wall? That is my citation for my MBE, which the Queen gave me, for political and public service. If you make the point that the life-saving equipment was inadequate uh, and the fact that there had been no lifeboat drill or anything else, so therefore, by definition, there was an immense amount of negligence or inattention paid to detail, why is it that I detect in you no bitterness whatsoever? I've lived long enough to know that there is no point in being bitter. If you're bitter, it hurts yourself. And you become grumpy and difficult. And uh, so I was bitter when I was young, I think, a bit. But now I have no bitterness about it because I realise it would be futile. And uh, I, I don't know how much longer I've got to live. I'm very old now, as you know. And I can look back on these things very differently from the way I looked at them years ago. One final question, if we might, back, as it were, to a note of seriousness. In terms of historical importance, how would you now want the Titanic disaster best remembered? I think, as to quote my friend Dr Ballard, although I think maybe he was quoting me, I think I said it first, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's a memorial to man's arrogance that you build a great ship and you're quite sure on that nothing can happen to it, you don't put enough lifeboats in it because you don't need them, and you declare it to be unsinkable, although I'm assured that the builders never said that, but that is how it was publicised. And I think it will never be forgotten because I don't think there's been any other disaster where there was no reason for anyone to die. And it, had there been enough lifeboats, you would have forgotten about it in a couple of years. People would have said, oh, yes, I know that ship has sank on its maiden voyage. But here we are all these years afterwards. And still it is remembered all over the world. And I think that's why, because no one should have died. That then brings to a close this week's programme in the series Reflections. My thanks to Eva Hart for being my guest, to Janice Bidwell for her research work, and most especially to you for listening. If you recall at the beginning of the programme, I told you in a very potted form the story of the disaster. Now let me leave you with some more food for thought. In 1898, 14 years before the disaster, an American author, Morgan Robertson, wrote a book about a huge Atlantic liner weighing 70,000 tonnes and 800 feet long. She carried 3,000 passengers and life-saving equipment for oh, only a fraction of that number. She was labelled unsinkable. On a cold April night in mid-Atlantic, she struck an iceberg and sank with colossal loss of life. He called his ship the Titan. Until next week.